Children's Library Lecture Series. Thank you all for coming today. We have a wonderful guest whose name even got into People Magazine a few months ago. When Jim Kimball came here last time, he spoke about Rosie the Riveter. And I don't know how many people were here. Well, when I was glancing through the People Magazine, I see Meet the Real Rosie. And then there's the article of how this, she was found, how she was found by our Jim. Now this is funny. Jim spoke here first. He teaches at Seton Hall University, and he spoke here first on January 17, 2013, on Norman Rockwell, the Accidental Four Freedoms. Then on October 22, 2015, who is Rosie the Riveter? And, um, oh, on 2014, I didn't, I left out that year, Red Wisconsin, the strange day when America lost the Cold, the Cold War. Now, these are all very interesting topics. And um, every time you've left, people think about all the things that they never thought about before. Now, today's topic, in the shadow of Hitler. Okay. <laughs> Leave it to your own imagination. Well, I wouldn't say, you're not going to talk about someone I told you about last night. <laughs> in any case, um, I, want, I can't wait to hear this in the shadow of Hitler. But I have to tell you this, this is very funny. In May, I contacted Jim, and it said on the phone that he was in Croatia. So I um, emailed him, and I got a letter back. From, I got an email back saying that he would speak here. So, and I wrote back to him something like, you can't escape him, even if you're about to grow. <laughs> it's the truth. What are the odds? I tracked him down. And he was there for five months in Croatia. I tracked him down. So these, these poor speakers, they, get, they don't get money and they don't get any. They can't run away from you. But in any case, I thank you, Jim. When I had your answer back the same day, I was, I was thinking, isn't he wonderful? He's, you know, to think about us over here. So we are very special to them. You are very special to us. Before I begin, I thank all of my fellow friends and librarians for all of their help and support for these programs. I couldn't do it without them. And now, please let's give a very, very big welcome to our very special guest, Jim Kimball. So Adolf Hitler was born April 20th, 1889. If he were with us today, he would be approximately, well maybe exactly, 127 years of age. He is with us, Trump. Well, there is that perspective. I was so excited to say it. I think it's safe to say that Hitler himself uh, isn't with us any longer. It's been a long time since he, he was there. But as I think about Hitler and his age, and uh, I think about this group, my favorite audience of all time, I keep coming back, it reminds me of what a young group we have here. Right? Uh, so it's always good to come back to this audience. I thank you for the invitation. I thank you to Phyllis for making the arrangements. And as you know from my previous talks, my interests tend to revolve around the World War II home front. So you remember some of those earlier talks that Phyllis mentioned. And I'm particularly interested when it comes to World uh, War II propaganda in the latter half of the war. How did the propaganda help the war to end and turn into peace? How do words and images move us from a time of war where we're belligerent to a time of peace where we're friends again. And that interest has brought me over a course of years uh, to a number of topics, and today, as well as announced, to this topic, In the Shadow of Hitler, looking at the memories of that man and his influence in the immediate aftermath of World War II. So what I want to look at specifically, although it'll take a little bit for us to get there, is a 1945 documentary called Hitler Lives. 
Now, this documentary was bizarre as we look back at it you know, over some 70 years later, and pretty curious, and yet it won an unexpected Academy Award the year after it was released, and in some ways it is a crossroads, it represents a crossroads in American history, of a road that we didn't take after World War II, a permanent record of what might have been. So to look at this film before we get there, we need a little bit of context. So here's my overall plan that I have in store for us for the next half hour, 35 minutes or so. First, we're going to dig into the Warner Brothers and their relationship to the memory of Adolf Hitler. And this is the Warner Brothers as in the movie making company. We'll meet some of those personalities. Then we'll take a look at uh, the, what I call the German doppelganger, this uh, literature metaphor that becomes a reference to the Germans as having this curiously bizarre split personality and how that may have played out. In number three, we see how Hitler lives, this documentary that won awards, apparently relied on that uh, trope. And then finally, in the concluding section, just want to reflect a little bit back to that idea of the crossroads, about a road that we didn't take, and why Hitler lives, even though it was really influential at first, we don't remember it as much as we do as some of the other movies that were also big from that era. So, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're going to get, uh, here we go, in the first area here, and to do so, we have to dig into our time machines. They don't get the uh, Back to the Future reference, perhaps. <laughs> that, that's a, a time machine that we have on, on the screen there. So we go back to 1945, and we're looking at what happened in late 1945 and early 1946. So what was going on in that era? Of course, the war has just ended, and many of you are familiar with this image that was taken just a few miles mm -hmm. from here at VJ, or Victory Over Japan Day. A couple of months later, in October, the Detroit Tigers win the World Series over the Chicago Cubs. The Cubs have not yet returned <laughs> to the World Series. That same month, the first ballpoint pen went up for sale. It's a good reminder for me that when I'm in the archives and I'm looking at World War II documents that are signed by people, those were not ballpoint pens that they were using. Also. Later that year, and then into early 1946, an organization that you've heard of called the Central Intelligence Agency was founded, and that's still with us too in a lot of ways. So people who lived in this time, in this culture, in late 1945 and late and early 1946, they're different from us in a number of respects. Relating to Hitler, we're of course certain that Hitler himself is gone. He couldn't be 127 years old and still be around. But those folks weren't so sure, some of them. After all, Hitler's body was said to have been burned by his officers, and so nothing <laughs> remained to be buried or as evidence that he was actually dead. And as you can imagine, there were a couple of conspiracy theorists here and there who speculated about whether or not he was really still with us. For instance, the Bradford, Pennsylvania Evening Star said, this is in the late fall of 1945, the most hunted of all the Nazis, Adolf Hitler, still is absent and unaccounted for. If he were truly dead, as most of his Confederates claim, why has his body never been identified or found? We have these same sorts of voices today, it probably sounds familiar. And yet, most Americans, I think, at this time, were ready to move on into the post-war world. They weren't obsessing about Adolf Hitler. After all, during the war, we had all seen these advertisements about how great the post-war world was going to be. You can buy, 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 and consume. You'll get new washing machines and cars. <laughs> all kinds of things were, that we were waiting up for at the end of the war. And so we were distracted. We weren't ready to cherish this old war. We were ready to move on. In addition, there was the idea of a new enemy that was just on the horizon. The Soviets, of course, were our allies during World War II. But it didn't take long for the, the US to realize that when the Soviets came into Eastern Europe, they didn't intend to leave anytime soon. And those folks in that new Central Intelligence Agency argued that they were indeed becoming 
a new enemy. So Americans, for the most part, were ready to move on, whether it was to a new war or at least away from the old one. But there was at least one American who did not want to move on from World War II. So I want you to meet this individual. This is Jack Warner. Now, Warner was the son of Jewish immigrants from Poland. He was born in Canada, emigrated to the United States as a youngster, and rose to become the head of the Warner Brothers studio. Now, he wasn't the kind of person who was worried about Hitler himself living on. He wasn't concerned about that so much, as he was concerned about Hitler's ideas continuing to live on. And why did he think that? What was he so concerned about? Well, in the summer of 1945, Warner and a bunch of other heads of uh, Hollywood studios were invited by General Eisenhower to Europe, where he asked them to tour uh, what was basically the rubble of the leftover battlefields, as well as a number of concentration camps, including Buchenwald and Bergen-Belsen. And as you can imagine, he was very shaken by that experience. And we have some good evidence that he was pretty shaken. Pretty immediately, he wrote a letter to his brother back in Hollywood, Harry Warner. And this is what he said in that letter. We need to keep reminding the public of what's been going on in Germany. This is an opportunity to show the world what beasts the Germans are, and that they will never be cured. For any nation of people who can do these things, and have been doing them from the time of Attila the Hun, should have their crimes pointed out to the civilized world. So he was feeling some passion when he wrote that. He was obviously pretty shaken. And when he returned to Hollywood, he treated it as a new kind of mission. As the historian uh, Christine Ann Colgan has said about him, his tour in Europe developed a conviction that Germany must never be permitted to rise again, and that all Germans were inherently evil. Think about that. And all Germans were inherently evil. So Warner had a project, or he wanted to develop a project, and he found one in a young director named Don Siegel. Siegel himself was born to a Jewish family, but he considered himself atheist. But nonetheless, he did have a few feelings about the Germans uh, and about Hitler specifically. And soon, he was at a work at a short documentary, about 20 minutes or so when it was finished, called Hitler Lives. And he had this to say about what he was doing as he made it. The idea that I was trying to accomplish was to show visually that although Hitler was dead, his evil spirit still lived. Mm, this sounds like an ominous movie, right? Well, his team borrowed graphics and even some of the original voiceover from a wartime movie created by this gentleman. This is Frank Capra, uh, who created propaganda films for the military during World War II. And then toward the end, they made a film for occupation troops in Germany called Your Job in Germany. So a lot of the footage and material from that movie found its way into Hitler Lives with a new narrator and a new emphasis and an extended ending, but it's similar in some ways to what the occupation troops would have seen uh, in late 1945. As the movie became, uh, uh, became ready to be shown, Warner Brothers decided it was going to do everything it could to back the movie. So back to our title here and then Jack Warner himself. He wrote a letter to theater distributors just before the movie came out, showing how committed they were to this. He said, There should be no limited prints on this picture. We are trying to save people and future generations to come. Hitler lives may help. So he was passionate still, even after all the time it took to make this documentary, that Americans needed to see this message about the evilness of the Germans. Well, the movie premiered in late 1945 in just a few theaters so that it was eligible for the 1946 Oscar season. We still do that today, of course. And then it opened nationwide in January 1946, less than a year after the end of World War II. And it was popular. People seemed to love it. Here are some of the comments that I was able to gather after the showing of Hitler Lives. The New York Times, 
This is an excellent picture, a sobering reminder that the doctrines of Hitlerism are still thriving. In Missouri, state officials said this picture should be re shown repeatedly throughout the nation. They really liked it. In Maryland, the Frederick News called it the year's short subject sensation. And even in Canada, the Winnipeg Tribune said, this movie must be shown by every Canadian exhibitor as a patriotic duty. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, right? Well, as I mentioned, it also won the Oscar, somewhat unexpectedly, for Best Documentary, short subject, that was in March 1946. And most astonishingly, to me, given this message, the movie inspired the Hollywood uh, Foreign Correspondents Association to create a brand new award, made specifically for this movie, called the World Peace Award. How that came about, I don't really know, because it's anything but peaceful. So, why was this movie so popular if people really wanted to move forward into the future? But one possible reason is that because it was a short, it was paired with popular movies, and so you would see it either before or after the main feature, and some of Warner's biggest stars were appearing on the same screen. We have names like Vivian Blaine, and Carmen Miranda, and Ray Milland, and Rosalind Russell, and Barbara Stanwyck, and Jane Wyman. These are big names. And people are going to go out to see those movies, and while they do, they'll probably stick around and watch 20 minutes of this documentary that people are talking about. That's one possible reason. But I think that there's another reason. My research on propaganda time and again has suggested that a propaganda appeal has the best chance of success if it relies on something that is already in the culture. In other words, if it's a brand new idea, it's going to be strange to people. But if it builds on something that the people already have heard of, that they might already think somewhere in their minds, then it's got a good chance to survive. So what is it in Hitler Lives that already existed? that resonated with those audiences. I think it was a bizarre trope, or a metaphor, that I refer to as the doppelganger metaphor. And that takes us to the second area that I want to talk about. So, how many of you have heard of the word doppelganger, by the way? A number of you have, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll offer a little bit of background here. I want to begin this section with a quotation from an 1833 autobiography written by this man. This is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. You've all heard of Goethe, famous German statesman and poet and so on. And I'm sure everyone here has a copy of this autobiography at home on your coffee table. <laughs> Just to remind you, he has this passage about midway through. He says, I now rode along the footpath, and here one of the most singular forebodings took possession I saw my own figure coming toward me in a dress that I had never worn. And as soon as I shook myself out of this dream, the figure had entirely disappeared. <laughs> Scary, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, Goethe's readers at the time would have recognized this passage as an allusion to an idea that had existed in German literature for a long time. And the term, just a couple of years earlier, had been invented for it. It was the term, the doppelganger. So it's a German word, originally, that we have uh, borrowed in English. And it means double-goer, double-person, evil shadow, evil twin, if you will, or mysterious other in some way. And it's something that is very common, not only in Germanic literature, but in many Western uh, series of literature. There are some scholars who study this area who argue that it even goes back to the Greek myth of Narcissus. If you see the visual here, you see Narcissus himself looking at what we could interpret as his doppelganger, that vision of himself, which is the reflection in the pool. Now for English readers, this idea of a doppelganger really becomes resonant in 1886 with this famous story. When Robert Louis Stephen comes out with the strange I forget the exact title, but Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it is a sensation in the English-speaking world. This idea that one person could have a wonderful personality, a good personality, and also an evil, warlike 
personality was rather stunning to people. But surprisingly, Stevenson appears to have based his novel on real-life events, because just the year before, in a famous case in France, and Stevenson was writing uh, in England, uh, we had reports of one Louis Vivet, who is the first recognized case of multiple personality disorder, or disassociative disorder. And the recognition of his case led to the recognition of many more cases. Suddenly people began to realize, there's this thing out there. It's, people can be different people all in one. And it's kind of bizarre, this new way of thinking. Uh, Sigmund Freud became very interested in this phenomenon, as did his co uh, colleague, I should say, C.J. Jung, who later went on to write about something that he called the shadow. The theory was that we all have elements in ourselves that we don't like, parts of ourselves that we prefer to repress, but when we repress them, they can come out as a different personality. And this can work not only in individuals in a psychological sense, but in countries, in entire cultures, it can have shadows. So you can see where this is going, that Germany may have a shadow. And in fact, Jung said as much, he was himself a German speaker, and he was very worried about the mental health of the Germans as a whole, an entire group. So by 1914, these various threads come together. Let me number those threads. Number one, we have this doppelganger idea from literature, this German myth of a mysterious double. Number two, we have the Jekyll and Hyde idea, this shorthand for good and evil in one person. And number three, we have the rise of psychologists and their recognition that this in fact could be a medical condition, a disorder related to something called the shadow. So all of this is coming together as the 20th century begins, and of course, early in the 20th century, what else do we have? But World War I. And so the Kaiser's Germany in World War I becomes the focus, at least in English speaking, uh, the UK and, and the United States, of these threats. And this thread continues all the way through World War II. Let me give you some examples so you can see uh, what I'm talking about in reference to the Germans and the German people. Let's begin with Oswald Garrison Villard. Here we are, writing in 1915. So here's some examples of this thread. There are two Germanies. One, the reactionary forces who believe in the divine right of rulers and in the mailed fist. The other being the infinitely noble, nobler journey, Germany of great souls. So there's two Germanies, he's saying here in 1915. How about Paul Brown, writing in the St. Louis Republic in 1917? There is a huge contrast between the Germany that sank the Lusitania in violation of the laws of humanity and sent Zeppelins to assassinate grandmothers, how evil is that, and the Germany of the life of the spirit, of goodwill among men, and joy to little children. What a contrast, these two Germanies. In 1921, André Tardieu in Tennessee says to an audience that post-war Berlin has fostered the old theory that there are two Germanies, one that willed the war and another which we trust to live forever at peace. Two more examples. In 1935, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, I don't think that paper is still around, but it had some great editorials in the 1930s, said, always there have seemed to be two Germanies. While one observed the treaty, the other had no intention of doing so. Does that sound like a split personality? It kind of does, right? Or a Jekyll and Hyde? Finally, in 1940, H.G. Baines wrote a book, and get this title, it was called Germany Possessed. Wow. In this book, he says as follows, Nazi Germany exhibits all the signs of a split mind, and its tyrannical masculinity is comparable to that of a schizoid man. Wow. That's some great testimony there, suggesting there's this theme that throughout the 1930s and into World War II, Americans have in the back of their heads, because people are talking about it, that there's this weird personality, something going on in Germany. They may be good, they may be evil, they may be both, but something is going on over there, and that thought has been going on for 30 years. And that is why I think Hitler Lives resonated with its audience at the time. 
And so by the time we declare war in 1941, that's what many Americans have in the back of their minds about the German enemy. So, let's fast forward then to 1946, where this audience probably still has this notion in its mind. Now, I wish we could watch the whole documentary. We don't have time, really, for that. I will show you some snippets here. And I have to warn you, there'll be some technological issues because I have loaded my snippets into my PowerPoint, but this morning, for whatever reason, they decided not to run, so I'll have to show it to you separate from my PowerPoint. So there'll be some short issues. Yeah, I don't know why I did it, because last night it worked just fine, but we'll see. Uh, so I wish we could watch the whole documentary. However, it is on the internet, so after our talk today, if you really want to see it and you have 20 extra minutes, I'm sure you can take a look. Um, I suppose the library would allow you to download, right, to take a look at a moving video. Okay. So we'll look at a few uh, snippets and see how this doppelganger metaphor uh, appears. And Siegel, our director, it turns out, spends a lot of time building that contrast that I've been talking about between the peaceful-looking Germans we have our, our title freeze here, and the warlike and bloodthirsty deeds of Germans. And they're especially duplicitous. So let's take a look at uh, the first uh, 40 seconds or so. And I have this one queued up, but bear with me and make sure it works. Hopefully we have the volume as well. <laughs> It's absolutely fascinating what you're saying. Thank you. Really. I don't have any volumes. Mm. Mm. All right, well, I will have to narrate it for you. I, uh, here we go. One more time. Hmm. All right, so I will have to narrate it for you. Uh, okay. So what he is saying here uh, is that swastikas, swastikas are gone, the propaganda is gone, all that remains in Germany is the various sorts of rubble. There is some beautiful scenery. Wow, look at that beautiful scenery, the narrator says. But it, we shouldn't let it fool us because there's a lot that we need to be very careful of that is in fact still very dangerous here in Germany. I'm going to pause it here for a second, and then I wish we had the sound. And we'll come return to German history here uh, in just a moment. So we have this initial contrast between uh, what appears to there appears to be in Germany and what is missing. And it gets the audience on its guard. Okay, what is it about these German people that I need to be really worried about? And then we have this next section. It's about two and a half minutes long. And while it's playing, I'll see if I can get the sound working again. Um, and I want you to notice, at least you'll be able to see the visuals here, uh, the personality shifts that we see going on between the good Germans during peacetime who suddenly turn warlike uh, in wartime. So let's take a look. And this is about a two and a half minute passage. getting some glimmerings of sound, but uh, I'll have to narrate it for you. And so I tell my students, when you have a technos issue, you keep going, right? Uh, so that's what we'll do. So you see the, scene, uh, the scenes uh, of Germany <coughs> obliterating its neighbors in the late 1800s. Now we're going to celebrate the war, and suddenly we are back to peacetime. Boy, aren't we just great people. We're so peaceful. Everyone in the world loves us. We have lots of culture. We're very idyllic. Why would anyone think that we're threatening at all? In fact, we have some of the world's greatest music going on here in Germany. Everybody loves us. Why would they be scared of us at all? And then, when you see this motif of a book, this is history that's proving how dangerous and duplicitous these Germans are. So here we are in World War I with Kaiser Wilhelm, and the story starts again, even though it's a new chapter. Now these peaceful Germans have turned warlike all over again, and we have another series of countries that are being obliterated under the German heel. Again and again, you can see the names coming up. 
You can see the names coming up more and more, and the destruction that these supposedly peaceful people uh, are doing when they have turned violent unexpectedly in the form of a split personality. Uh, so this series goes on for a little bit longer. Now the Allies are winning. We go into Berlin, and suddenly we discover, hey, we like these people. They're kind of cool. They're nice. Look, they have beautiful cities and music. What were we thinking? They're not really warlike. And then, and then, so we leave. Uh, the Allies leave. Germany goes to Chapter 3. And again, it starts all over. So you can see how this series uh, of arguments is working. And that brings us, of course, up to World War II, that next chapter. Talk about Jekyll and Hyde, right? We have the peaceful Germans on the one hand, and we have the nasty, warlike impulses of those same Germans on the other. But it's more than the nation itself. It's not just the nation. It's the people as well. And the movie goes on to suggest that they have what the narrator calls the super race disease, or the world conquest disease. What are the symptoms of this disease? Well, the, the narrator tells us that apparently it manifests as a warlike personality combined with a peaceful one, very much like that of a split personality or disassociative disorder. Worst of all, just like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you can't really see it. In the story, no one looks at Dr. Jekyll and says, oh, you're Mr. Hyde, right? It's hidden from view. And the same is apparently true of these Germans in the movie. The evil warriors are there, but they're inside normal-looking people. A little bit later, I'm going to fast forward this to about 5 minutes and 48 seconds, you're going to see an interesting passage, which I'll narrate again, that shows us these ordinary people and yet suggests how evil they might be. Actually, I talked long enough, I'm almost up to that. Okay, so... So he suggests, you know what? Most of the people who were part of this Nazi evilness are still around. All those people who were parts of the, uh, uh, the, the officialdom, the Nazi officers are still there. The SS guards are still there. The officials within the government that swore allegiance to Hitler are still there. They're everywhere. Your average, everyday person in Germany may very well have been part of this evil network. And they may look like they're innocent, but look at this vast network that they were a part of less than a year ago. And then it goes to this list of occupations. They look innocent. Postmen. Right? Uh, we have farmers, we have fish, fishermen, we have uh, needle workers, we have cooks. And so it's trying to say that these people all have this dangerous and deadly conspiracy hidden within them. And then you see the swastika. And then it goes into this long section about how the mo ones we most need to fear are the children themselves. So we go back to our PowerPoint here. All right, so you saw our three clips there. Make sure that we're up to the right point. There's the third one. Okay, so do you see the doppelganger metaphor at work? Even if you couldn't hear it, you only heard my voice. What we see there are these innocent-looking Germans who have these warlike tendencies. And I think that this appeal would have made a lot of sense to people in 1946, precisely because for 30 years they had been fed a steady diet of there are two Germanys. Germany has something wrong with it. It's both peaceful and warlike, but we can trust them. So, I do want to mention before I move on to this last section, that if this idea of evil duplicates in the movie sounds familiar to you, it may be because you're thinking about a movie that came out just a few years later in 1956. This is a scene from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which has a similar theme. Right? That hidden enemy that can seize us at any moment and uh, reach out to get us in an evil way. And who was the director of this movie? Do you remember? It was Don Siegel, who also directed Hitler Lives. So he obviously had a fondness for this sort of theme. 
and we can see a definite connection back to Nazi Germany in this hit from 1956. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the appeal of Hitler Lives. I do want to end up today by taking a little bit of consideration for that road not taken. Because I think if Jack Warner had had his way, we as the United States would have spent a long time treating the Germans as this unredeemable enemy uh, and perhaps ignoring the Soviet threats. And that is not actually how the history turned out. In fact, it turns out that Hitler Lives itself had a pretty short lifespan. People seemed to love it when it was in the theaters, and then when it left, they didn't talk about it anymore. Unlike some of our classic movies from the war era, which were talked about for generations. <coughs> Here, obviously, we know Casablanca, we know Mrs. Miniver. Uh, Hitler Lives really isn't talked about very much at all after 1946. So I'm wondering if there is a way to account for this long-term failure after the short-term success. So very briefly, I want to sketch out two possible reasons. The first, here we are, why didn't its message last? Well, I think one reason that I mentioned earlier was that we were shifting our focus to a new possible war. To illustrate this, in February 1946, in Fulton, Missouri, the local movie theater was playing Hitler Lives. Just across town, Winston Churchill was visiting, and he gave a famous speech that we now know as the Iron Curtain speech. There in that precise moment, Hitler Lives on one side of town, the Iron Curtain phrase being invented on the other side of town, we see that changing of the guard, that focus on the past shifting to the focus on the future, this new potential enemy in the Soviets. So that's one possible reason, uh, and indeed the tensions with the Soviets continued to increase. By 1948 we had the Berlin blockade, and it only became worse from there. One possible reason. A second possible reason was the fate of Germany itself. So immediately after the war, Germany was divided into four quadrants. Three of those quadrants eventually merged to become West Germany. But for a long time, Germany was divided into West Germany and East Germany. And I don't think it's a coincidence that those same English speakers who conceptualized a good Germany and a bad Germany still had something like that to think about, except now the good Germany was West and the bad Germany was East. So in a sense, if we continue our psychological metaphor here, Germany had been strapped down in the mental hospital, uh, perhaps that's not a very PC way uh, to put it, um, but it was confined in some way. Its illness was under control. Both East and West had a firm hand in Germany's future. It was in an ideological straitjacket, if you will. Now, of course, most Europeans were delighted if they weren't German at this turn of events. For instance, the French novelist uh, Francois Marillac wrote this, I love Germany. I even love her so much that I'm delighted that there are two of her. <laughs> but not everyone agreed. The historian uh, Viet Valentin, I couldn't find a good picture uh, of this, this character, uh, wrote in 1949, No reasonable person is going to try to wean the Germans from being German. It's possible to reform it, but not to transform it. It is possible to develop the good and suppress the evil, or rather to develop the good in the evil. So, was he right, or was Jack Warner right? How long was this shadow that Hitler cast? Well, that's probably a question that others should answer, or at least speculate on, because my expertise, as I said, is in the 1940s. But I think it would make for some good discussion amongst you all, if you have any questions. Everyone has the capacity for evil, wasn't it? Uh, the banality of the evil. Banality the banality of evil, right. Uh, and her phrase, in my interpretation, suggests that even your everyday average pedestrian person um, has that capacity <coughs> to at least contribute to a regime of evil. 
And so it's, it's a sense of passivity, and she was saying we need to be active and resisting. And it's interesting now that we're looking at, in the 1940s, that Germany has taken in so many immigrants now, in today's world, where people, where countries are trying not to take them. It's a remarkable turnaround. Anywhere you go in Berlin today, I don't know if you all have visited recently, you'll see um, a memorial where the German people more or less apologize for what went on during the war. It's, it's just remarkable how many memorials there are. Um, so, you know, this um, our fault, our fault, we feel bad is, is everywhere there. Um, and so I think that's part of that, is there's, there's still kind of atoning in some ways. But there, was, but the, there also seems to be a backlash among some Germans. Yes. They don't want to take in these people. Yes, and I think so they've reached sort of a, a moment where it's starting to change a little bit. Um, and so, uh, is it President Merkel? I don't know what her official title is. Um, Chancellor. Chancellor. Chancellor, thank you. Mm -hmm. Chancellor uh, Merkel <coughs> would like it to keep on going, but there are a lot of folks uh, who don't want that at all. Um, so they're facing a, a very serious ideological discussion there. Hmm? Yes, sir. Without this doppelganger effect, being present in the American Army during World War II, do you think the American Army could have found enough soldiers to man the death camps in the numbers that the German Army had soldiers in the death camps enforcing what Hitler wanted done in the death camps? I, I've often wondered if the American Army could have done what they did. Done it. So could like the Holocaust have happened yeah, here, yeah, yeah. right? with the doppelganger effect not being present, presumably, yeah. in the United States. Or is there something, like in the water, you know, in Germany, that made it possible to happen there? Or in all of us? Um, it's a good question. I mean, a lot of these questions are very specific to the time and place. So Germany faced a very serious economic and spiritual situation coming out of World War I. Uh, they had this demagogue arise at just the right time who was very persuasive. And as much as we, you know, hate Hitler and everything that he stood for, you know, as a person who studies rhetoric and propaganda, I have to give him his due. He was a master orator. He was very, very effective. So absent him, it might not have been possible. Absent those conditions, it might not have been possible. Um, but you know that the old phrase, is it uh, there but for the grace of God go I? Um, I'm almost afraid to look into the American character and find what could be there. Because I think... Many cultures have that potential if the, if the ingredients are right and the time is right. For us, it was not, so that's good. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yes. yes. A long time ago, there was a study, I think it was in California in the 50s, do you know the one I'm talking about? Where they had, um, they, they brought in just ordinary volunteers and they told them this is a very, very important study. Yeah. And the person, uh, you're going to tell them to do something, and when they make a mistake, you're going to like push this button, and it's going to give them a shock. <laughs> and you're going to do it, uh, you know, and then it'll show like a danger zone because you're going to go past hurting the person. And what the, uh, what they found was that a tremendous number of people pushed the button past where the danger zone was because they felt like this scientific study was so important and they had to kind of follow orders. And they did find, and they, they did this in California, I believe, with American citizens of different ethnic backgrounds. And they did find that there were, in different ethnic backgrounds, a more or less potential for how important it was to follow orders. What the people didn't know was that it was total setup, so that there was really no electric shock and nobody got hurt. But the people who were pushing the button past the danger point, which would be a little equivalent to, uh, I mean, it came right out of you know seeing whether this could happen in our country. And um, that's not really all. I you're wanted. you're exactly right. And in fact, we still talk about that study today. It, and every professor is familiar with that case because. Uh, now, whenever you do a study involving people, even an interview, you have to be approved by what's called the Institutional Research Board. Uh, and their mission is to make sure nothing like that can ever happen. 
Um, and so all the professors grumble about it because it's a lot of paperwork. Um, but they had no approval to the, or that kind of study because there was no such board, uh, and arguably it harmed those people. Well, it didn't yeah. harm them. I mean, it Let me just their, their thinking. It yeah. harmed maybe the, the yeah. people who were willing to push the button where yes. they were like killing the person or whatever. But uh, it didn't harm the other person. But to me, that was like unbelievably scary because it really says that almost anybody, anybody could do it. And like you said, mm -hmm. there, but for the grace of God, we didn't go. And when you look at some of the things that happened in our country against different groups, with whole bunches of people, you could, you could see how it's you know possible any place, and it's really scary as to whether it will happen again. Let me give you one more example, if I may. So I, I think did I, I talked about Red Wisconsin here, yes, the, the town that went communist for the day. So I'm doing further research on this, and they had uh, American Would you legionnaires. Give it to the people? Hmm? Would you give a little for the people who didn't okay. see it? So this research project was about a little town called Mosinee in Wisconsin that went communist for the day on May 1st, 1950, just as a show to demonstrate to Americans what the dangers of communism were. So it was this big pageant, really. But they, they brought in American legionnaires from neighboring towns to serve as the fake communists, and their job was to kidnap the mayor and the police chief and, and fake execute them. But they were so rough on these guys you know, the, the mayor actually had a heart attack and died oh. right after, uh, and they all said it was because he had been treated so roughly. They really got into this idea of seizing people. You know, they were they they, they began to live the moment. And these were uh, Americans who had fought for the U.S. in World War II, veterans. So, other questions? Else? Uh, do you think it accounts for good leaders? Uh, you know, a good leader. How is it that the Scandinavian countries seem so, so much better than the Russia or the Germany or, I mean, now, now Russia yeah, has, you know, like Putin. Yeah. And how much is the leadership accountable for and not the people themselves? That's a really good question. <laughs> well, there is such an idea as organizational climate or organizational culture um, so that I'm familiar with, um, which, so there's an interesting study uh, that was done in Illinois where they had a, a plant that had had this long history of sexual harassment, like real, some really bad cases. And so they just cleaned house. They got rid of everybody, they transferred everybody, and they brought in a whole new workforce. And they found that the problems continued. There was something in the superior structure, you know, the, the higher level management, that kept it going, even though they had gotten rid of as many people as, as they could. Um, and so that suggests to me, and I'm not an expert in international relations, that it's possible that countries have a sort of long-term psyche. You know, so Russia has been invaded again and again and again by Europeans, by like Central Europeans and Western Europeans. Um, and so perhaps it's the case that over time they develop this kind of bunker mentality where uh, a strong armed person uh, can take control and people wish for that. But I don't really know. That's a fantastic question. <clears throat> Yes, uh, I'm uh, of Armenian descent, and I know that there was something that he had said because of the genocide with the Christians and the Muslims in Turkey, and he made a comment on who remembers the Armenians, which was our genocide. It's, it's very true. I mean, some of these civilizations, it's, it's remarkable to many Americans because we have such short memories. Um, but there are conflicts in this world that are going on because of something that happened a thousand years ago. Or more, you know. So it's it's the case that civilizations do tend to nurture their hurts, I think, uh, and that may influence their leadership in some way, for good or for ill. One other thing: does the movie in the Shadow of Hitler at that time movies were worshipped? Let's put it this way: a lot of people went to the movies. Mm -hmm. In today's world. I don't know how one movie would influence an entire nation or, or a group of people. It's a good, see, good point. Well, and, and let me make sure that everyone knows it's, the movie was called Hitler Lives, so if you look it up later I want to make sure you get the, the right one. Um, would it have the same effect today? I think you're right, it wouldn't, because not as many people would see it. We're more distracted. 
I mean, think of all the times, do you all go to the movies? You, know, you see the people, and their phone rings, and they're busy texting, right? Even if it were playing, would they pay attention to it? Uh, so we're a very different culture than the 1946 moviegoers were from. Uh, and so it's probably more of a specific time in a specific place. We didn't have the multiple distractions yes. that occur today. Yes, it's, it's just incredible. Um, so what do I say in my class all the time, you know, because they have their computers, their laptops with them, don't shop for dresses, don't check your stocks, <laughs> don't Facebook, right? focus on my class. And do they, mostly? <laughs> I got one, one yes and one no. Was that rehearsed? Come over here, can you come up? Oh, you're, you're being drafted, come on. <laughs> Was that just rehearsed, but one said yes and one said no? no. <laughs> <laughs> one wants an A. Yes. Oh. 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 Is that right? Are you asking them a question? Or no, I would like to say hi. Can you introduce them or have them introduce themselves? <laughs> hi, I'm Tyler. I'm a freshman at St. Hall, and I am in Professor Kimball's uh, oral communications class. Hello, I'm Trudy. Um, I'm a junior, and I'm a business major, and I'm in this class. <laughs> Thanks to you both. I'll make sure you get appropriate credit. <laughs> and yes, they are in my public speaking class, which is why I said, yeah, come on. And there was another student who had to go to another class, so he got out of it. Thank you. Any other questions? I like this sweatshirt. Oh, thank you. And they're seat in hall blue. Uh, yes. Well, just to comment, uh, they alluded in the film that, you know, all Germans were really bad. They were warlike and kind. <clears throat> and isn't it more a, a, <clears throat> a thought about who the leaders are and, as was mentioned, what were the conditions in the country? economically, no jobs, people desperate. And so Hitler was able to come in with his talk and uh, propose <coughs> changes. And with all due respect to the present election, I'm listening to two people who are running for president, one who doesn't say very substantial things, plans, but simply insults to the other person. Yes, sir. Yes, and uh, not that I think you know he's not Hitler, but yet the conditions are such: people crying about jobs, etc. And then the other person who talks about, I will with a specific plan. So you know what what could be the outcome of that? And well, one, yeah. good. so I, you know I am of, of German heritage, German descent myself, and so I sort of see in American history this powerful threat of German-Americans. Um, and of course, there were many people in the US who were German emigres um, who had come over before Hitler came into power. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure this movie wasn't talking about them, right? They weren't evil at heart. So I think that there's certainly an aspect here that we shouldn't overlook, which was they were talking about a specific place, specific time. And a lot of that may have come down to the leadership and the, the conditions that they were in. So that's a good point. Uh, let me ask a question over here, and then I'll come back to you. Yes, um, but they did, even in the States, change German streets and German, specific German names. They got rid of them right after the war. Mostly that was World War I. I mean, okay. there was a little in World War II. Um, so, you know, I'm from Nebraska. Uh, there was a town uh, named Berlin. They just changed the name. <laughs> World War I. They stopped teaching German in the high schools yeah. in World yeah. War I. Uh, and I, you don't see too much of that in World War II. There was some, um, but just less vitriol, I think. For some reason, the Kaiser really set people off. Uh, yes? You, you mentioned that study in that town where they had the American Legion guys come in yeah. and play. Well, have there not been some other studies uh, involving younger people where those playing the roles suddenly got carried away with the viciousness of the yes. role they were trying, they were told to play, particularly to say at very young age, to say under 21. There is, I mean, you mentioned one, uh, there was the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, which ironically, they made a movie about this recently, uh, and ironically, my advisor back at George, my mentor, I should say, back at George Mason was one of the people involved in this. He was at Stanford back when they did this. He played a guard or something, uh, and it was exactly the case. People just got carried away with their role. Um, 
So, you know, maybe the it's dark the, side of their roles. The dark, yes, the dark it's side. back to uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the shadow, if you will. All right, so we have time for a few more questions? <coughs> okay, we'll do three more questions, then I better go plug my meter. Uh, it's not a question, but the British royal family changed its name. Hmm. Hmm. That's it a good had, point. To Windsor. It had not been. It was a German name. What was it? Do you know? I don't remember what, it, but it was a German name. Oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that. And, and Windsor is is so British, isn't it? Yeah. Windsor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Also, so that the Germans in history have always been strong on education, like Einstein and many of them before them. It yes. was the forerunners of mental capacity. Yes, I mean, the, the, and in fact, they had an interesting educational culture. Uh, perhaps you've heard about their, uh, they had a dueling culture, so the men would duel, and if you had a scar from dueling, uh, it was a status symbol. That was all part of, wrapped up in their education system. Uh, but you had this it was sort of a competitive system. It's a little different than what we have. What made them so yeah. Uh, certainly got a lot of them ahead. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's an observation, and you probably also made something similar. One of my favorite observations about human nature came from Margaret Mead in her autobiography. She was commenting about her three husbands, how they each treated her very differently, from very kind to extremely harsh. And her observation was the way they treated her was really what was internalized, how they treated themselves. She was very astute at observing people. And the husband that had a kinder nature towards himself was kinder outwardly. And the husband that was raised to be the tough boy and not make any mistakes, he was very hard on himself. And he was hard on the people around him also. I think Freud and Jung would, would make a lot of that. I mean, it's so true, isn't it? This what we keep inside of ourselves, uh, even if we try to hide it, sometimes comes out in other ways. Um, and I think that's the case here. But you all have treated me so well and not hostilely, not in a hostile way. So thank you for inviting me back. Thank you.